Computer System Types Whenever we talk about computer systems, we need to realize that we do get it in multiple variants. For example, we would typically find single user computers versus multiple user computers. Now, single user computers are generally used by one person and in many cases might be owned by one person, whereas with multiple user computers, these are typically owned by an organization or company and people share the computing resources. Now, when we look at single user computers, it's important to realize that we do get two categories. Originally, we started with non-portable computers and these were typically your desktop computers. And more recently, we're seeing that people actually prefer more portable computers in the form of laptops, tablets, cell phones, etc. Now let's go and look at each one of these in a little more detail. First of all, portable computers. The subcategories for portable computers are handheld computers, smartphones, laptops, notebooks or ultrabook computers, netbook computers, as well as tablet computers. And we're going to look at each one of these shortly. Now let's start off by referring to a handheld computer. Handheld computers were typically your PDA type devices where you would have had a device and you could flip the screen open and the device would contain a small keyboard. So if you look at the picture at the right hand side, um, this is typically what we found. So we're thinking in terms of some of the older phones like the Nokia 9300, etc. Now, these types of single user computers provide ease of portability due to their size and because they include either a stylus or a touch screen as well as in many cases a compact keyboard. Now you would find that um, on certain versions they would only give you a stylus without a touch screen on others you might find only a touch screen and then therefore on others you might find a combination of a small keyboard, touch screen and stylus. These would typically communicate over wireless networks and in certain cases would also include GPS capabilities. The disadvantage of these devices, however, was that they required a lot of power. So unfortunately, um, at that stage when they developed and released these, we didn't have the battery or the backup capabilities that we have nowadays. The next type of portable computer that we're going to refer to, smartphones. Now, I'm sure everybody knows by now what a smartphone is. This is typically where we have a mobile phone with a lot of additional capabilities. For example, it would include a camera, web browsers, emails, MP3 players and other functions. Another more popular and familiar portable device that we find a laptop computer. Now laptop computers are designed for mobile users and these are relatively small and light wave, lightweight sorry, and can sit on the lap of an individual. So the same capabilities that we have with your traditional desktop computers are now embedded into a smaller device. In terms of computing power they are just as powerful as desktop computers um, in recent days, they have actually become more powerful due to the fact that it's portable, it requires less energy, and it takes up less space. And especially people in job environments where they need to travel, they would typically prefer to have these with them. Let's continue to look at notebooks and ultrabooks. These are smaller than your laptop. They come with a natural user interface. Now, natural user interfaces, we're going to talk about that a little later on as well, typically comes with um, embedded assistance such as voice controls, touchscreen capabilities, um, always connected to some sort of network, allows you to work on it for the whole day, has enough processing capabilities, etc. These are also considered to be extremely lightweight. So typically you would find that for a laptop computer you would get it from let's say 10 inch screens onwards and with your notebook ultrabook computers these would be your smaller 
screen sizes such as um, 7 inches and smaller. The next category that we're going to refer to, netbook computers, are the smallest in the range of computing, or in the family of computers that we're discussing now. So these are around a kilogram in size, um, again smaller, good for tasks that do not require a lot of computing power. So these type of devices um, perhaps has a little more limited capability. For example, you just want to use it to send and receive emails and access the internet. And they are relatively expensive when compared to other devices. The last category for portable computers tablet computers which has also gained a lot of popularity in recent years again these are portable lightweight computers they come in most cases without a keyboard but they do provide you with touchscreen capabilities so your interaction will be on screen people typically use these in homes offices factory floors and um, it's it's said that it's almost like carrying a clipboard just the interactive electronic clipboard. Some of them do come with a writing stylus and if there's no other input capability, if it contains a writing stylus, some people also refer to it now as slate computers. Most of them has embedded speech recognition so you can talk to the device, it would recognize what you're telling it and then it would perform certain actions. We do find combinations of tablets with um, perhaps keyboards, or perhaps a, between a tablet and a laptop, and these are referred to as your convertible tablet PCs. Now a convertible tablet PC, if the keyboard is embedded or contained on the tablet, you would um, swipe it open or you would lift it up. You would have your keyboard and it would have the same appearance as a laptop. Otherwise, you can flip the screen around. The laptop would be at the bottom screen on the other side and then it would give the appearance of a tablet. And nowadays you even get some of these convertible ones where you can remove the keyboard from the screen. For example, if we think in terms of the Microsoft Surface PC as well as some new laptop convertible PCs provided by Acer and Mesa. Now let's go on and talk about some of the non-portable computers. Non-portable single-user computers come in four types. You've got your thin client, desktop computers, nettop computers as well as workstations. Now the thin client is a low-cost centrally managed computer which doesn't contain any extra drives or expansion slots, meaning that it's a very small computer, it's connected to a screen, um, it's connected to a keyboard and a mouse, but it doesn't allow you to put in CDs, it doesn't allow you to add um, any other devices like scanners, those kind of things. So it's much smaller in its size, but it do provide you with the necessary processing processing capabilities in order to go and perform your tasks. They do have limited capabilities, um, only give you access to essential applications. So typically companies would use these where they don't want their customers, or not the customers, sorry, the employees to go and install other programs on it where they want to limit the usage of the devices. So there's no hard disk, meaning that it cannot pick up viruses, so the whole computer is linked to the company's computer system and it makes it actually more secure. Any data and software that you need to use will be downloaded from the network and we typically find that with these types of um, devices that companies are actually linking up to cloud resources. Examples, we do find Apple and Android where they now, nowadays got TV boxes. Again, if you think in the South African context, it might be similar to what we know as the DSTV and the Top TV um, clients, where it only allows you to watch TV and channels and it has limited capabilities. 
perhaps a better known example the desktop computers desktop computers are highly versatile computers they're actually named for their size that has a lot of processing capability memory and storage so typically we would find with a desktop computer you would find your system unit similar to what we've explained at the beginning of this section and you would have all your devices connected to that system unit the next category net top computers a net top computer is an inexpensive desktop computer but it's again designed to be smaller and lighter and it consumes much less power than compared to let's say your desktop computer again it's going to perform basic processing tasks and it's designed to be not portable and comes without a screen but in many cases it contains optical drives so typically examples of these include you would find that these are attached to let's say a screen in this case and then your processing capabilities is contained in there and we find these in banks and some larger companies workstations these types of computers were considered to be more powerful than your traditional personal computers but again they were small enough to fit on your desktop but they were more expensive so where did we find these in major companies you would typically find that in your office you would only have a screen and a keyboard and that is linked to the network so you aren't physically connected to a system unit but you're rather connected to the mainframe system now let's go and talk a little about multi-user computing systems these can be categorized as being designed to support work groups from small departments about two to three users ranging to larger organizations where you find thousands of users now if you look at the image on the left hand side that's an example of the server room perhaps in a very large company so all the workstations and all the employees in that company would be connected to these devices now we do find it in various formats or categories servers blade servers mainframe computers as well as supercomputers now let's go and look at each one in a little more detail when we talk about a server we are actually referring to a computer that can be accessed by multiple users to perform specific tasks these devices contains large memory and storage capabilities and they are quite fast and efficient when it comes to handling requests communication all those kind of things we do find that we get it in different um, environments for example you might find a web server where the intention is that it handles all your internet traffic and communications as well as perhaps access to your company website we get file servers where the company want to share let's say for argument's sake documents and um, spreadsheets and database access files and those kind of things to the employees in the company so it coordinates the programs and the data sharing then we find enterprise servers and these servers typically stores and provides access to programs that would meet the needs and the requirements of the, of the whole organization so in most large organizations you would find that they've got an enterprise server and everybody links up and communicates with that particular server now there's two other definitions that we need to touch on and these include server systems as well as server farms a service system can be categorized as multi-user computers including your supercomputers mainframes and other servers so this is where we've got a combination of devices working together in order to achieve a goal a server farm can be referred to as a large number of servers that are situated in the same room so if we go back to the previous slide the image here can be referred to as a server farm because in each one of these units you would find multiple servers now let's continue to the next category a blade server blade servers houses many computer motherboards which might contain one or more processors 
storage, memory, and network connections. So if we look at the image here, these are typically referred to as your server racks. And inside the server racks, you've got your individual blade servers. Now, each one of these servers might have specific tasks or capabilities. So some of them might be reserved for storage capabilities. Some of them might be containing all the processes. So depending on your requirements and your needs in a company, you would go and upgrade these types of services. These type of devices would all share a common power supply as well as an air cooling source because they are contained in these central server racks. They require less physical space because we're now putting them together and we would typically find it again in company environments where they've got dedicated server rooms and all of these devices would be contained within that server room. Now let's go and look at the last two, mainframe computers as well as supercomputers. A mainframe computer is a large, powerful computer that shares hundreds of concurrent users or that share the resources to hundreds of concurrent users that are connected to a machine via terminals over a network. So typically, you're connected to your workstation computers. So imagine you've got a company with a thousand users so instead of buying a thousand desktops, which would be expensive, you just go and purchase workstations and all of these workstations are linked up to one or two mainframe computers. It typically resides in a data center and it contains its own heating, ventilation and air conditioning. And then in most cases, because the data situated here are very protected and um, valuable to companies you would find that they only allow limited access to these environments. The last category for multi-user computer systems are supercomputers. Now these can be considered to be the most powerful computers that has the fastest processing speed and highest performance and we do find that these are very special purpose machines. So if you think back to one of our previous slides we talked about um, server environments where, let's say for argument's sake, Disney and Pixar are working on special effects and they would require these specialized computers because um, hundreds of thousands of tasks should be conducted in order to get to the end product. Now for the last section, we're going to look at data centers. Now what are data centers? A data center is a climate and access controlled building or set of buildings that typically houses the computer hardware that is delivered to all the users within the company. So for example, if we think back to what we've seen in the previous cent in the previous slide, this can be considered to be a data center. Now we do find that companies would invest in this due to various reasons and it mainly comes down to the growth of the company. So they would typically need to add additional computing capa capabilities. They need to add additional data storage capacity as well as bringing in all the data centers of that company from various branches and locations and making sure that everything is linked up together. Now, whenever you construct and design these data centers, it's important to make sure that it's going to enable efficient operation and that it's going to reduce the energy and processing and cooling requirements that you need. So we would typically find that companies go and they design these buildings and these units, units in such a way that it's modular which would allow them to add other devices to it, other server rack, service farms and mainframes. And also many companies actually nowadays go and they try to place it in areas where there's milder climates and lower energy rates and land costs because it can become quite expensive for you to maintain and run these. Companies nowadays also tend to place their data centers in locations where um, perhaps it's less prone to disasters, for example, where there's hurricanes, earthquakes, terrorism attacks, wars, all those kind of things. 
So they would typically place it in countries where they can do it very cheaply and where they know there's not a lot of disasters that could affect the running of their business resources. Now what we do find that many companies do nowadays is that they take old shipping containers and that they build the mainframes and the computing resources within those containers. So the container will include the HVAC system as well as all the computers, the servers, everything. So if they want to add additional resources, they can actually go and do so quickly and just link up these different data centers to one another.